thank you for joining us for today's expert presentation about Moscow's 10 magnificent railway stations. My name is Natasha Baker and I'm the marketing manager for Golden Eagle Luxury Trains. And our host for today will be a familiar face for many of you as she's the longest serving tour manager on the Golden Eagle train. It is the lovely Tatiana Kolesnikova. Now, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of traveling with Tatiana, she's worked for Golden Eagle Luxury Trains for over 15 years as the primary tour manager on the Golden Eagle train. And I know that she is eagerly awaiting our next train departure up to the Arctic Circle in December. Tatiana has a passion for trains and all things uh, history related with Russian railways. So I know, as, as many of you do that are joining us today, so I know that you will enjoy uh, this brilliant presentation that she's put together for you. So that's it from me. I hope you're sitting comfortably and, and I will now hand over to Tatiana. Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to welcome everybody on our virtual tour of Moscow railway stations, since we cannot go there and waiting for the world to open again. Now, look at this map. Uh, Moscow nowadays has 10 railway stations and nine of them historical ones dating back to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, form a circle in what nowadays is a downtown part of Moscow. And only one Vostochny station is located in a distance, in a suburb. But this circle gives you a perfect idea what the suburbs or the city limits of Moscow were at the beginning of the 20th century. And the history of all these stations is closely connected with the construction of the railways in Russia. At that time, most of the Russian railways were built by the private companies. So as we look through the history, you will see what was the priority for business people, for the entrepreneurs, for industrialists, which railway lines they considered most uh, profitable at that time. And uh, all of the stations have changed their names many times. Again, that reflects the construction of the railway lines in Moscow and the area in central Russia. And as you can see, three of the stations are located very close by. They are all located on one square. Nowadays we call it Komsomolsk Square, the Komsomol Square, but commonly it is known as the square of three railway stations. Originally, there used to be a big artillery yard here, which exploded in 1812 when Napoleon was attacking Moscow. And since then, nothing was there. And when the railway, first the railway came to Moscow, they decided it's going to be a perfect place for the station. And here's the first station that appeared here, called Leningradsky Station. Then the second one, Yaroslavsky, a little bit further. And the third one, Kazansky. So that's where we begin our tour. And the first station we're going to visit is Leningradsky Station. You will go there if you want to go to the northern parts of Russia, to St. Petersburg, or even Finland and Estonia, which unfortunately is painted at the moment. 1842, the Russian, uh, 1851, Russia have constructed the first real long railway line, the line that connected the two capitals, St. Petersburg and Moscow. It took them nine years to build, build a line of 645 kilometers. By the way, for the first time, Russia was using the gauge of 1524 millimeters or five feet, which is a standard gauge for Russian railways nowadays. All that was happening during the reign of Nicholas I, the Russian emperor who greatly supported the construction of the railways in the country. And when this line was constructed, he was one of the first passengers that crossed the line. Can you imagine how scary it was? Normal travel, between Moscow and St. Petersburg, back in those days would take three to five days. And the train which the emperor took crossed the line in 19 hours. So when the, uh, the emperor was on the train, he was getting off the carriages when the train was crossing the big bridges and walking behind the train. Anyway, on the 1st of November, the regular operation of that line started. 20 to 22 hours. That's how long it took to travel between Moscow and St. Petersburg. And definitely, original name of the station was Petersburgsky or St. Petersburg Station. In a few years, in 1855, 
Nicholas I died and to contribute to his effort, to his support of the construction of the railways, the station got the name Nikolaevsky. Later on, what happened in Russia, the revolution? So in 1923, the Tsar's name was born and the Oktoberski, October Revolution Station, the new name appeared. When uh, St. Petersburg later on was renamed into Leningrad, the Lenin's town, Leningradsky, that's the modern station name, uh, the, the modern name that the station has so far. And when the railway was constructed, uh, the architect, the most architect of the time, uh, Konstantin Ton, you can see his picture here, uh, was ordered a project and he designed two station buildings for both Moscow and St. Petersburg. And they were constructed at the same time and look how identical they, uh, they are. Uh, the one in St. Petersburg, the capital, was a little bit bigger though, but what a surprise it was for the passengers getting on board the train in St. Petersburg, getting off the train in some 20 hours and seeing exactly the same station. It was quite a spectacular building at that time. Original decorations had oak floors and marble heating stoves. One thing they had heated toilets, a very unusual thing at that time. And special imperial quarters were located there. But definitely during the Soviet period, all those decorations were gone. It have, the interior have been redecorated, redecorated many times. Statue of Lenin appeared and gone. Now it's a very modern space. This station is known for a very special train, the first Russian deluxe train called the Red Arrow that was running between Moscow and St. Petersburg or Leningrad actually, because it was launched in 1931. Uh, quite an expensive train with high level services, even special engines were designed. It was running overnight, getting to Moscow in the morning, uh, or get into St. Petersburg in the morning. And in those days, in uh, 1930s, high rank party officials, foreign delegations, some uh, official visits, that's who was using the train. The train is still running and it covers the distance between Moscow and St. Petersburg in eight hours now and still going overnight. But this is also where the high speed trains started running. Moscow and St. Petersburg, a lot of business people, a lot of people living between the two cities needed a quick access. So first high-speed train started running in uh, 1984 and covered the distance in less than five hours. Nowadays, Sapsan train is running between these two cities and covers the distance in three and a half hours. And the project is to continue developing it to make it even faster. Uh, well, we're moving on, on the same square, and we come to another station called Yaroslavsky. Yes, uh, that's where the Trans-Siberian trains depart, the trains to the Baikal Railway, and the trains going to the north, Archangel and Varkuta. By the way, this train nowadays handles the biggest number of passengers, up to six and a half million passengers per month. But most of them come from commuter trains, not from long distance trains. Now, um, look at the history of the railway line, which was constructed um, by a private company. First of all, private investors were considering um, what would be a profitable line to build outside of Moscow. And they decided that uh, building a very short line going to the place called Sergei Fossad, only 70 kilometers from Moscow, could bring up quite a lot of profit. What was there? A famous monastery, the Trinity Laura of St. Sergius, and that attracted a lot of pilgrims. And that line was constructed in 1862, and for that uh, line, a small terminal was built, uh, Troitsky, or Trinity Station Terminal. Uh, but then later on, uh, the line continued to Yaroslavl, a big old Russian city uh, with a lot of commerce. And then even later, it continued to Archangel, the port on the Northern Sea. So that definitely uh, attracted a lot more traffic, a lot more uh, passengers to travel, a lot more freight. By the way, the names of the station changed as well. As soon as the, as the line reached Yaroslav, they started calling the station Yaroslavsky. But then in Soviet days, the name was abandoned for more than 30 years. What was the reason for that? You'll be laughing. But in 
1918, after the revolution, uh, there was a big uprise in Yaroslavl against Bolsheviks. So they decided we need to eliminate even the name of this, uh, that word, the name of that city, even from the station name, to keep it forgotten. For 30 years, it was called the Northern Station. But then the name came back, Yaroslavsky. That's how we know this station nowadays. And definitely, as the traffic became bigger, the passenger the number of passengers grew, the old station became too small, and the new station was commissioned to a famous architect of the time, Fedor Shechtel. He's particularly known for uh, his buildings built in the Art Nouveau style, very ornate and very beautiful. And that's what he used for the station. Quite a unique building, a blend of the Art Nouveau and ancient architecture of northern Russian towns. Look at these roofs from the old churches uh, from Vladega Lake, the northern part of Russia. Look at the entrance to the gates of the Savior Monastery in Yaroslavl, which was quite a famous at that time. And look at this building. This, uh, this is where he took his inspiration. Uh, the decorations on the walls were also quite unusual and special. Tiles especially made for this uh, station. Uh, the, the combination of blue and green tiles were made to resemble the northern lights. Uh, the subtle colors show the subtle colors of the northern uh, nature. But in the Soviet days, definitely some of the bus reliefs uh, were replaced by the Soviet symbols, which were considered much more appropriate than the figures of the, Arch, uh, the Archangel, for example. Uh, inside of the station, it was also decorated quite uh, in a great way. A famous Russian uh, artist of the time, Konstantin Korovin, have created a series of paintings specifically for that station, showing the life in the north. Uh, the fishermen, the northern lights, uh, hunting the whales, and all those pictures decorated the interior of that station. It was quite a new concept for the railway stations of that time. And uh, in the 1940s, all those original paintings were removed from the station. They were placed in the Tretiakov Art Gallery. But after a recent restoration, uh, the copies of those stations were placed back inside, which we're very happy about. And uh, the history of the Yaroslavsky station uh, became connected with the Trans-Siberian Railway in 1905, when the line was linked to the Trans-Siberian. That line was under construction still uh, at that time. And by uh, 1910, 1915, most of the Trans-Siberian trains were already departing from Yaroslavsky station. Originally, the other terminal was uh, the uh, main station for the Trans-Siberian. Uh, so in, when in 1949, Mao Zedong arrived to Moscow, he arrived to this station, Yaroslavsky station. Later on, when big construction projects were held in Siberia, like the building different uh, hydropower plants or building the Baikal Amur main line going across the northern end of Lake Baikal, uh, all the expeditions, all those young people who participated in the construction started from Yaroslavsky station. And this station uh, was the first uh, where the section, uh, this line, Yaroslavsky line, was the first to be electrified. So the first electrical uh, engine carried the train from Yaroslavsky station as early as the uh, 20th of June, 1929. We're moving on and on the next picture, you can see here two stations, two ends of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Look at that. This is Yaroslavsky Station, and this is the station in Vladivostok. Uh, that uh, terminal was reconstructed, rebuilt basically in 1912, and it was specifically made to resemble the starting point. So there's, those are the two ends of the Great Siberian Way. In Moscow, on the platform of Yaroslavsky Station, you can see a zero kilometer of the Trans-Siberian, and in Vladivostok, you can see the terminal point, 9,288 kilometers. That's the length of the modern day Trans-Siberian. Okay, let's go across the square and we get to another beautiful, very ornate station, Kazansky Station. This is where the trains go to the east and southeast from Russia and also to Kazakhstan, Central Asia, some other places. 
This train handles the biggest number of the long distance trains, the station, sorry. And uh, again, look how this private company, another private company, was developing the railway in this area. First, they built a short line going to a city of Ryazan, central Russia and southern Russia were the most developed parts of the country. So that's where the major railway lines were uh, going. And uh, for the trains coming, uh, going to resign, a small wooden station was constructed. But what kind of a station was that? It did not have a platform. It just had the tracks. So when the trains were arriving, gentlemen had to jump off the carriages and carry their ladies in their arms. There was no any other way. Definitely people were complaining. In two years later, the first stone building appeared. That's what you can see on the picture here. But later on, the same railway company have decided to build a line towards Kazan. As I mentioned, those were all private companies. So they were choosing the destinations which were important for the business. Kazan was one of the centers uh, for Russians. Uh, the road to, the, uh, to Siberia, the road to the east, went across Kazan. So the same line later on was continued all the way to Yekaterinburg. And definitely the old station became too small, so uh, it was too busy for the traffic. Soldiers, on this picture you can see soldiers departing from the station going to the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. Uh, traditionally it became a big hub. In 1920s people were coming here in search for jobs. So new, uh, the project of a new station uh, was uh, commissioned and architect Alexei Shusev uh, won the contest. You probably heard that name if you have been to Moscow, to the Red Square. Shusev is the one who have designed the mausoleum of Vladimir Lenin on the Red Square. Uh, you can see him at the construction of the new terminal. The construction was going on quite slowly. They had to dismantle the old building, build the wooden sheds, temporary sheds. Then the First World War started that delayed the original project for quite a long time. So it was actually continuing through the Soviet period and a lot of the ideas that Shusev originally wanted to implement, the decorations he wanted to put in, never happened. But the station was constructed uh, mostly in 1926 and then by 1940s, yeah, the whole project completed and it survived several reconstructions in its history. Originally, the idea was to build this uh, Kazansky station as the gates to the east, connecting Europe and Asia. So this is what Shusev have done to make it like that. Look at the main tower of uh, Kazansky station. It resembles greatly the uh, famous Sayombike Tower, one of the landmarks of Kazan Kremlin, an ancient tower. On top of that uh, main tower of the station, you can see a picture of the dragon. His name is Zealand Dragon, another symbol of Kazan. Now look at this clock. Uh, the clock on Kazansky station was designed by Shusev himself, but he took as a model uh, the clock uh, from St. Mark's clock tower in Venice. One part of the station, which originally was handling the luggage of the passengers, uh, looks very similar to one of the towers of Moscow Kremlin, Kutafia Kremlin, uh, Kutafia Tower. Quite a unique construction. Inside the station was also beautifully decorated. Uh, and it's probably the most spacious of all the stations in Moscow. Definitely in the Soviet times, uh, the original decorations that Shusev planned to put in never happened, but a lot of Soviet symbols were put in there. What is the most beautiful and decorative in that station is the imperial waiting room. Originally, it was created for the restaurant room, then it was used for special receptions. And ladies and gentlemen, I cannot wait until we're going to meet there again, because most of the Golden Eagle uh, trains, most of the Golden Eagle train tours in Russia depart from Kazansky station, and this is where we have our special reception exclusively for our guests. And next time when you're going to be on the uh, on Kazansky station, don't miss out something rather new. This is the uh, monument to the creators of the Russian railway, which was unveiled only in 2013. 
And that shows the uh, portrait of Nicholas I and Russian engineers who contributed to what? To the creation of the Russian railways. Going on, and the next station is looks very, very modern. It is called Kursky Station. Biggest in size, can handle up to 11,000 passengers at a time. Um, Recently, the station uh, handles mostly a lot of commuter services. Only very few of the long distance trains depart and arrive here because the new station was built in Moscow and a lot of trains were moved there. But in fact, one of the, the second oldest station in Moscow was located very close by to this place. Look at the map of the railways that were serviced from this station. First, uh, the railway line was built from Moscow to the city called Nizhny Novgorod, this number three on the map. Nizhny Novgorod was the most important trading center of the old Russia. There was a huge fairs, huge trading uh, markets going on there. It's on the Volga River, the main transportation way of Russia. So at first, a small terminal to service this line was constructed then later on, the same company have constructed a railway going to Tula, Aryol and Kursk, cities in central Russia, which had quite a developed industry. And uh, the first terminal, original terminal, was not big enough for that. But Nizhogorodsky terminal was built in 1861. It was wooden, not nothing really left from it till nowadays. The only picture I could find is this one with a little kid in front of it. And in fact, it was always considered a temporary terminal. It was located very close to the modern Kursky terminal. And when the new station was built, the old terminal was used for cargo until 1950s, and then it was dismantled. But in 19, uh, sorry, in 1877, that terminal uh, was always was often very crowded. A lot of young people, young ladies, young uh, men, were traveling from that station, Nizhogorodska station, to a little place called Abirovka. Uh, the reason for that was Leo Tolstoy had published his famous novel, Anna Karenina. And this is where was her last trip. This is where she went from Moscow to her final jump under the train. And a lot of young people wanted to see and feel what she was feeling and she was seeing in her last moments. Well, uh, the traffic on those lines became too big, uh, too busy, and uh, the old building was not suited for that. The new building was constructed. Uh, they called it Kursky Station. And they, this station was a little bit reconstructed in 1930s and then operated as it was until 1970s. Uh, the traffic at that time, traveling by train, was much more common than, than going by the airplanes, for example. So the uh, road on the traffic on the trains was much bigger. So the uh, Moscow government decided we need to upgrade, we need to enlarge the building, and they have constructed a very modern looking concrete and glass building, which looks very, very modern inside nowadays. But this uh, station is a bit like a nesting doll. It has something inside. As you walk through the modern part of the station, you can see the original rooms of the first, first stone building, the old building of Kursky Station, incorporated in this modern building. They recently have been restored and they look really, really nice. And even part of the building you can be seen from the platform. Okay, moving on. And the next station that was constructed in uh, Moscow was called Beloruski. And once again, it's a Russian gate to Europe and south uh, uh, western part of Russia, Belarusia, Lithuania, all European countries, the gateway towards Europe. That's how it is regarded all the time. Let's look at the map. Here's Moscow and here's the cities going west. And the first of them was Smolensk, an ancient Russian city and definitely a big attraction for the businesses. And this is where the first railway line was built and small Smolensk station was constructed. Further on, the line continued to Minsk and Brest, and further even to Warsaw later on. Uh, definitely the uh, traffic became much bigger. They have enlarged the station a little bit, and that's how it was 
uh, in, uh, was operated until, until 1907. A lot of important events in the history of our country are connected with the station. And the first of it was the coronation of Nicholas II, which happened in May 1896. Uh, a special coronation, a special imperial pavilion, wooden one, was constructed next to Belorusky station uh, for the coronation train of Nicholas and his wife. All the coronations of Russian emperors was only done in Moscow, uh, in the churches of the Moscow Kremlin. And they say this was one of the most glamorous ceremonies ever held uh, in the Russian Empire. In fact, there was a special imperial terminal constructed not far from this, those three stations on the square for uh, the imperial coronation train. We still don't know why Nicholas have chosen to use a different station. Uh, probably they were afraid of terrorism. That was the time when terrorist attacks were quite common. Uh, later on, uh, the emperor have used that platform quite a lot. Nowadays, the platform is still there. Uh, even the canopy over the platform and the station is still there. But nowadays, it's a ticket office for one of the commuter st stations uh, of Moscow trains and you cannot go inside. There's nothing uh, saved inside from the original beautiful interiors. Uh, so, coming back to that uh, station, uh, Belorusky station, they, uh, it needed a big reconstruction. So, the works were started in 1907 and completed between 1910 and 1912. And look at how big and beautiful this new station was, uh, built in the uh, beautiful empire style with all these eagles on the top. Uh, when the station was reopened, it got a new name. It got the name Alexandrovsky, or Alexander Station. Why is that? Look at the year, 1912. This was 100 years of the war over Napoleon, a victory over Napoleon. And it was a huge, big event for Russians at the time. They had big celebrations everywhere. Everything that was happening in 1912 uh, was devoted to the war against Napoleon to the victory over Napoleon. This was the first patriotic war for Russians. And Alexander I was the emperor who defeated Napoleon, so the station was named after him. The revolution came, and definitely the Tsar's uh, name was removed from the station, and it was named Bresky again, and then Belorusky, and all the imperial symbols born from the station decorations. Even inside, a lot of Soviet uh, style decorations were added to the original imperial interiors. What is special for this uh, station is, since it was our way, our gateway to the west, this is where the troops went to the front of either the First World War, you can see uh, General Karnilov welcoming the troops going to for the First World War, and wounded soldiers coming back, uh, to the same station, or during the Second World War as well. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a very interesting, unusual uh, memorial uh, platform, memorial sign there, devoted not to the people, but to the sun. The sun called the Holy the Sacred War, which was first played at that station. And for Russians, it's probably the most famous song of the Second World War. Every Russian knows that song, and that's probably the most impressive one from the war times. And the same place welcomed soldiers coming from Berlin after the victory. So nowadays they have a very touching little monument devoted to all the soldiers who went to the front from this station. We're moving on, and we come into another station, which is called Kievsky, another place where trains go to the west. 
east, uh, southwest and west from Moscow. This whole uh, station is connected with Europe because this square in front of it is called now the Square of Europe. In 2002, a Belgian sculptor, Olivier Strebel, have uh, presented to Moscow his fountain, the abduction of Europa, and that gave the name to the whole area. Uh, connecting Moscow with the uh, Western regions and with Kiev particularly was an important project because that, main line, that line was mainly um, planned not for passenger train but for a lot of cargo. Kiev and that area had already a network of railways, particularly the ones that connected uh, Kiev and the coal mining areas to the south. And that line was specifically built to transport a lot of cargo, mostly coal, from the big coal mining areas. So the small wooden, mostly wooden station was built uh, and it was uh, handling only two passenger trains, but a lot of cargo trains. Uh, but as the line continued further on, the traffic became bigger and they definitely needed more space for passengers, for goods, and the project of a new station was designed. Uh, the private company that was running this line have requested city authorities for permission to build a new station. That's how it should have been done at that time. They got a permission and they got a plot of land, but they had one condition. Before you start building your new station, you have to upgrade the existing transportation system. What it meant at that time, build a new bridge across Moskva River. This was called Borodino Bridge. Borodino was one of the places where the heaviest bottles of the, the main bottles of the war against Napoleon was held. So the new Borodino Bridge was uh, uh, constructed and only then the company could invest in building the railway station. So the construction started in 1914. By 1918, it was already opened and uh, it was a little bit enlarged in 1940s, operated as it is until, operating as it is until nowadays. Uh, there were quite a few interesting features in that station. First of all, a clock tower with uh, four different faces on the clock. Uh, that clock has a unique mechanical controls, a mechanism that can be moved only mechanically. Nowadays, Russia doesn't go between summer and winter time, but when we did, somebody had to go up there and move the clock by hand. Uh, the uh, station building was built in a so-called neoclassical style, but the sculptures were made out of concrete. At that time, it was a new progressive material, and the original decorations were all uh, devoted to the war. Uh, victory over Napoleon. Definitely later on uh, a lot of the uh, decorations were changed after the Second World War. Uh, the new bus reliefs of the Soviet uh, period appeared, devoted to the war, in, in the, to the victory in the Second World War, but a lot of the savings and original decorations were still preserved and restored. This is one of the most beautiful stations inside. Another thing that is quite unique on that station is the, uh, a huge uh, platform shed, which was built by engineer Vladimir Shukhov, quite a famous engineer at the time who was known for all these light metal constructions. Uh, look at the size of this uh, shed. It is 321 meters long and 28 meters high. It's one of the biggest in, the, uh, in Europe. Uh, and it was that, as it is for almost 90 years, it was renovated only in 2003, 2004. So at that time, they had to make a new construction welded together. Originally, there were rivets. And so only a few original constructions with the rivets were left on its place. And it's still holding, uh, covering the platforms there. It looks quite spectacular. We're moving on. And the next station on the line is called Paveletsky. The destinations uh, for the stations were Volga region and south southwestern parts of the country. And uh, this station is quite, uh, the history of the station is quite interesting. There was a railway company, again, privately run, which was called Rizanska Uralsky Railway. It connected city of Rizan, number one there, city of Uralsk, later went to Astrakhan, uh, to the Caspian. Uh, it connected 
towns in 12 different provinces of South and Central Russia, but it had no connection to Moscow. And uh, finally, in 1900, they decided to build a railway line from a small town called Pavelets to Moscow. And the terminal there was constructed for this Pavelets station. Uh, and uh, it was a beautiful building, quite nicely decorated, and it operated as it was until 1980s. And then the building started to decay. It was too small for the operation. At that time, the big recon uh, reconstruction was started uh, and uh, the capacity of the building was increased six times. Well, though nowadays, again, the transportation uh, model of Moscow have been changing for quite a, long, uh, for quite a lot. And uh, nowadays, the station handles a smaller number of the long distance trains, but the biggest number of commuter trains, up to 83 commuter trains per day. And uh, what is also uh, special about this station is on uh, January 23, 1924, a funeral train carrying the tomb of Vladimir Lenin, who have died just a couple of days before, arrived to the station from his residence called Gorky. And uh, later on, the actual engine and the carriage carrying the coffin of Lenin were removed from operation and were placed on the platform as a memorial. And later on, a special museum of uh, Lenin's funeral train was opened there. It was used quite a lot in the Soviet days. Young kids were brought there to join the young pioneers and so on. But in the 1990s, the interest to that museum faded away. And nowadays it's incorporated in the uh, Museum of Moscow Railways. We're moving on and we're coming to another station, uh, probably one of the most ornate buildings uh, among all the stations in Russia, uh, in Moscow. It's called Rishki Station, uh, but it is, and it was designed by the uh, Polish architect Brzezowski, but it is designed in the traditional Russian style, architecture of Russian palaces of 17th and 18th centuries. The history of the station is also connected to Latvia. Uh, a company uh, running goods, uh, a trading company uh, running goods to the uh, Baltic were interested to getting a quick access from Moscow directly to the ice-free ports of the Baltic. And this line was built to the place called Ventuspils, which is in Latvia nowadays. Or in old days, they were called in Russian Vindava. Uh, this railway was completed by 1904, and in 1901, this railway station was constructed. Uh, the train started running as soon as the station opened. It was at that time one of the most modern stations. It uh, had its own power station and had electrical lights even inside and on the platforms. But press them. very often the passengers were complaining for two things. First of all, the big clock, which is located on the station building right here in the, in the middle. It often was late and people were complaining that they missing get missed the train. And the second thing, the trains from Vindava arrived to Moscow late in the evening. So it was a hassle for passengers to get back, to get to their homes. There was nothing there. It was a remote um, suburb. Uh, the outskirts of Moscow. Actually, the company that was building this station, they got the station under one condition. You have to redevelop the area around. But Moscow was developing very fast. And soon, uh, this station became in the uh, very center of Moscow. And the two busy thoroughfares are crossing now in front of that station. The traffic situation became really bad in 1990s. So 1995, a big reconstruction project of the area happened. Nowadays, the station only handles the commuter trains from this year. Uh, before, there was a uh, long distance train going to Latvia, but nowadays, because of the pandemic, it stopped running. Uh, but there's one train that runs from this station every year on the 9th of May, uh, the Memorial Victory Train, going from Rizky Station to a place called Dubasekova, where some of the most severe battles for Moscow were held. This station also have seen a lot of people going to the front of the Second World War 
and coming back after the victory. Now, the last station of the old ones, Savelovsky station. Historically, the smallest stations of a station of all. And uh, actually, Savelovsky line is the shortest part of Moscow railways. It covers only 130 kilometers. Why on earth uh, successful uh, businessmen like Sava Mamantov, who sponsored the construction of that line, uh, would invest in building this line, which really didn't have much of the operation. The reason was it was the shortest access to the Volga River from Moscow. Uh, look at that, at this map. Here's the city Yaroslavl, which stands, Yaroslavl stands on the Volga. Volga is very big and navigable here in this part until up to the city of Rybinsk. But then beyond Rybinsk, nowadays there's a big artificial sea here. But historically, rapids started here. And uh, navigation on the Volga, which much more difficult, was much was much more difficult here. Uh, rivers were the main transportation ways for Russia, so uh, goods have to be uh, moved to the barges or the smaller boats and slowly moving down and down and down. So the um, Russian business Russian business people decided we're going to be a railway line up to this little village Savelova. This is the only station that is named not after a, any big town or city, but after a small village on the Volga. And then the project was, we will continue this line along the Volga to Uglich, to Rybinsk. It didn't happen. Uh, the times changed, the sit economic situation changed, but the Savilovsky line was used a lot, uh, was, became very important in 1918 when Moscow was suffering from uh, famine and hundreds of people were coming to that station to meet the trains from uh, the Volga, bringing bread, bringing wheat. Uh, and uh, it was constructed in a remote district, a suburb called Butyrsky suburb. Nowadays, when we talk about Butyrsky, Butyrka, we remember a big prison that existed in that area. But actually that area at that time was famous for the steam tram line that operated there. And the first electrical tram uh, was constructed there. The tram line was constructed there in 1899. Look at this interesting picture. Such electrical sanitary trams were used during the First World War when wounded soldiers were coming to the Mo were brought to Moscow. Trains were sent to all different stations, uh, including Savelova station as well. And uh, such uh, Savelova station had a special platform where such trams could drive in and the soldiers could be taken from the medical trains to the hospitals by a tram. Moving on, uh, the area looked quite small. The station always had a very small number of uh, passengers because it was kind of a successive, excessive line. There were other destinations, uh, other lines going in the same destination. But still in uh, 1980s, they decided the reconstruction on the reconstruction of the station. They even constructed the second floor uh, but then nowadays, the, there's no long distance trains here at all. It only serves commuter trains and the express train to our express train to uh, Sharimetyo Airport, one of them. Well, we're a lot of talking about closing that station completely, but it is operating so far. It is connected nowadays to the new uh, system of the light metro, which uh, is connecting Moscow with its further suburbs and suburban towns. And now this last station, the newest station, called Vostochny, the Eastern Station, which was inaugurated on, on the 29th of May 2021. Why that station was built? It was built in the outskirts from the center, uh, away from the central part of Moscow. Uh, and actually that's what a lot of people are complaining about, because we are so much used now to get off the train in the central, uh, central districts of Moscow. Uh, but the idea is to ease the traffic load on the central Moscow, uh, move the transit trains away from the downtown parts, uh, have passengers get off the train there in uh, the suburb 
and transfer to the uh, uh, to the metro system or the white metro going to the suburbs. This is a modern hub, uh, and this is, I think, how the future system of Moscow railways will develop. Uh, the long distance trains that arrive in Moscow and depart from Moscow, that terminate their run in Moscow, uh, will be stopping probably somewhere closer to the center. But all the trains are trains uh, now moved away from the central part of Moscow to this suburban station. This is how the stations were built originally. All of them were originally located in the suburbs of Moscow. So ladies and gentlemen, we have been around all the train stations, major train stations of Moscow. And I want to thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting for you. Welcome to Moscow and let's go and see it with your own eyes. Thank you. Absolutely. I cannot wait to be back in Moscow and to go in to see some of those places that you've mentioned, Tatiana. That was a brilliant presentation. So thank you so much for delivering that for us today. Uh, I should have mentioned, obviously, Tatiana is in her home at the moment, um, over in Irkutsk in Russia. So she is, um, it's very late at night where she is. So we do appreciate you staying up <laughs> to do this. So we have had some questions come through um, and I will start off with some of those now, Tatiana, if you're still okay to answer some for us. Mm -hmm. So the first one we have um, was just asking, you talked about the victory train on May the 9th and we just wanted to know whether it's just for ceremonial purposes or can tourists and local people ride that specific train? Well, uh, as to the victory train on the May 9th, uh, it has to be checked nowadays because I don't know, it used to be open for public, but you have to, re you have to register in advance. Uh, and also there were special invitations for visiting the train because obviously the capacity is quite limited. So they had delegations from uh, different factories or whatever going there. They had the veterans particularly going there and uh, students of the military schools were going there as well. So this is what, uh, uh, what it was. But people could come and see the train. Mm. Well, it looks like it's a, a, a brilliant celebration to be a part of, even if you're just there uh, witnessing it. Yeah. We have another question, um, which is a myth that I th is well known uh, about the suggestion that the word for railway station in Russian, which is okay. Vauxhall, yeah. came yeah. from the station Vauxhall in London. Is there any truth to that? Uh, Vauxhall and Vauxhall. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of stories about that. In fact, um, the first places that were called uh, Bugzal appeared in Russia. Definitely they were taken from the word Vauxhall, but they were not the railway terminals. They were places where they organized parties, where people were coming for music, for meeting together. Um, and then uh, when Russian engineers have seen uh, the terminal in a place called Vauxhall, they decided that this is the name that can be applied for the station. So in Russian, it was converted in the Russian word Vagzal, which now has nothing to do with Vauxhall, it's just the name, uh, the word that is translated as a terminal, a station. Perfect, well, you've answered that question very well for us. We have had a question, um, just well, there's an anonymous question here just to say, um, uh, Komsomol Sky Station was the most beautiful they've ever seen, uh, and what was its history? Now, you talked about the square, the start of the presentation. Um, um, I'm thinking that probably that station, uh, that question is about the metro station, yes. but we were not talking about the metros, we were talking only about the uh railway stations. Uh, so Komsomolska Square, um. And there's a Komsomolska metro station, but there's no Komsomolska railway terminal. Yes, and we could do a whole other presentation on the metro stations in Moscow because they are absolutely incredible, just like the railway stations that you've discussed in today's presentation. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly. But they, they can obviously join us on the tour for that because I know we include that in, as part of the Moscow city touring program that we do as well, obviously, to go and see the Mos some of the Moscow stations in real life. So we have had some other comments just asking uh, whether 
obviously which of the train stations um, goes to Siberia. So you did mention that, but for those who missed uh, that. Okay, yeah. So the uh, the trains to Siberia, the regular trains on the Trans-Siberian Railway nowadays mainly depart from uh, uh, Yaroslavsky Station. But historically, the trains to Siberia were going through uh, going from the Kazansky station. When you come on to Siberia by the Golden Eagle, we will be departing from the beautiful Kazansky station, the gateway to the east. Absolutely, in that gorgeous imperial waiting room um, that we depart from there, that will be there to welcome us all back once we, obviously we can, we can do so. Um, there was another comment just asking whether, obviously that people can share this presentation that you've done. Obviously it was a fantastic presentation. As I mentioned at the start, it has been recorded, so a copy of this whole presentation will be live on our YouTube channel from tomorrow, so you can feel free to share it with any friends and family that you, you have. So thank you very much for everyone's questions. I think I've got through them all that have been sent through. Um, and thank you again to Tatiana for your time. Tatiana will be presenting for us again towards the end of September, hopefully. Um, we're doing a presentation on the winter Trans-Siberian journeys that we offer on the Golden Eagle because it's been a, a highly sought after topic after the Trans-Siberian one that you did for us um, last year. So please do join us for that and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you everybody, thank you for listening. Hope to meet you all on the train in Russia.